One, two. All right, we're going to get started here for our closing keynote. Uh, come on in, move in. Please don't stand in the aisle there. Find a seat. There's, there's plenty here. Uh, well, we're wrapping here. Uh, we have two wonderful things, uh, uh, a keynote and then a terrific performance, uh, which I think will maybe put you in the spirit of Maker Fair on the weekend. And I want to thank you for sitting. I hate in some ways to have, you know, make you sit in a seat and listen to, but there's such great speakers here. Um, but remember, on the weekend, you get to walk around and see all this stuff and move at your own pace, which is really the heart and soul of what Maker Fair is about. Um, I wanted to introduce, uh, come on up, Steve. Um, I told you to go look at that 3D printer out there. And uh, just as a, a quick uh, cameo here, uh, watch that cord there. Um, come on, this is uh, Steve Wygan of See Me CNC um, from the metropolis of Goshen, Indiana. And, uh, uh, you know, Steve, I think, has one of the great stories. Uh, I've run into him at Detroit and other maker fairs. But tell, tell us how you got started in, in doing 3D printers and stuff. Well, you see, it was about three years ago. And I was one of those Indigo crowdfunding campaigns. But the difference is I was already a machine shop. I already made hardware things, at CNC machine parts. I made injection molded parts. I make the injection molds. We make it all over in Goshen, Indiana. So that's an important thing for guys like starting a campaign or something to think about. You know, they were talking a little bit about some of this stuff, and that's a real important thing is, oh, we can market it and sell it and how are we going to make it? So what goes on in Goshen, Indiana that makes it kind of a, a rich area? Well, Goshen, there's a, there's a lot of uh, the trailer manufacturing, the, like the camper trailers and that. There, I've never did any of that. I never wanted to. <laughs> uh, I always wanted to, to make my own thing. So, uh, well, so tell us about Part Daddy here. Okay, it's Part so, Daddy. So Part Daddy is a... First of all, my website's taken out. It's actually an old name, partdaddy.com. I changed up about eight, ten years ago. Instead of calling myself Black Point Engineering, I called myself partdaddy.com. <laughs> I wanted a, a less serious name. And literally overnight, I got more work. So I was like, well, that was kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> so what I ended up doing, um, I thought the name needs to fit the machine. And... Uh, Number one guy, John Oley, he said, the name's got to fit the machine. I said, well, the big one's going to be the part daddy. It's like the granddaddy of printers, you know, that we were making. Mm -hmm. So that's how the name came about. It's a nickname I carried 
me over the years just for the fun, having fun. So tell us what it is. It is a 17 foot, 17. actually, tall delta printer. A delta printer is a parallel kinetic mechanism, it's a robot. But uh, you've seen it in the 3D printers, it's the three arms that come down and uh, do the 3D printing. It's unique in that it's easily scalable. You have three identical linear motion mechanisms. It's, it's, fairly, it's more economical to manufacture than three different linear motion mechanisms. Um, but your part's stationary. So it's, it's really interesting. I just got it running. Um, I'm going to be printing with it in the morning. Awesome. So what have you printed on it? Okay, and Monday this week, there's a black part that's the hopper. The hopper loader was the first part for itself that I printed. The very first part is that big, green, ugly vase. It's just the first thing it printed, so I, we had to bring it. Um, other than that, I've got quite a few failed prints. <laughs> so you, you, take, you take the little... 3D printers, and you, you fail a print, it might be 50 cents or $5. You take that and fail a print, it's 20 to to $100 or more. So it's uh, an expensive habit. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to wish you good luck, and I, I know it takes a lot of gumption to sort of pack and haul that here and set it up inside, but it's a great thing for people to see. Um, it's definitely not a desktop 3D printer, is it? No, not by any means. <laughs> okay. I really appreciate you having us here, and thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Okay, appreciate it. Um, so uh, our closing keynote is uh, the CEO of Intel and uh, 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 Persanich, uh, who I believe is a CEO about a, a year with, uh, uh, with Intel. And I'm just delighted to see the way that Intel has kind of connected to the maker movement, connected to our Arduino with the Galileo product. But most importantly, and I believe he'll talk about it, how they've really identified and, and cultivated the maker community inside of Intel. So please uh, please welcome Brian Kersanich from Intel. Thank you. To take out my show and programs here. Um, so good afternoon. I'm I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to be at the at the Maker Con today, but I'm I'm even more excited about this weekend and coming to Maker Fair. So um, Maker Fair for both myself and my family. I have two daughters uh, and and my wife. Although my wife's kind of so-so about it, but my two daughters. Uh, Maker Fair is like one of our funnest, uh, most enjoyable events. We really enjoy going to. So I, I, Dale and I have been talking back and forth for probably a little over a year since the, basically I became the CEO. And, um, you know, I, I said, hey, I'd like to come out. I'd like to come into the fair, and I'd, I'd like to talk to the, to the organization and, or to the people. And he said, sure, that's great. So I've been thinking about what to talk to you guys about because a lot of what we do um, is kind of different than the maker community, right? We, we make a lot of things. Uh, we make about a million things a day. That's about how many chips we make at Intel, about a million a day. Uh, and so we do make a lot of things, but it's a kind of a process that's not very user friendly, let's just say. But I thought, you know, there, there is a trend that started at Intel that is, um, when I really thought about it, it's part of us going back to our roots, I believe. And I started thinking about my early days as an engineer at Intel and how, um, you know, you used to get a, you know, silicon technology wasn't as advanced as it is today. And, and so you'd get a tool in and the first thing you'd do is you'd pull out your wrenches and you'd start modifying it because you knew you could build this thing better than the way the equipment manufacturer did. And so what I realized is that making has been a part of Intel since its creation. And we've really tried to reinvigorate it. So I thought my, my discussion today would be a little bit about the importance of making in a large corporation. And so my goal is to connect with all of you here today and say that there is a place for people with creativity, with skills that are outside of the mainstream uh, corporate world, right? 
that it's important for the creativity side, how you reinvent things or how you invent things, even in a large corporation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and then I'm going to, I'm going to actually try and give you some examples. And then we're going to have a little bit of fun, too, um, because you can't come to Maker Faire without fun. So um, as I said, at Intel, I believe we were founded by a set of makers. And, and the three there on the left are uh, Andy Grove, Robert Noyce, and Gordon Moore. And um, if you really take a look at them, they came out, uh, Gordon, for example, came out of Bell Labs. and um, they were real makers. They were making the first transistors, uh, solid state transistors, right? They were, they were inventing back then. And that's how this whole industry came about. And sure, it's expanded, but, you know, I have talked to Andy about the very first microprocessor that they put together the, uh, um, way back when, the, the 4004. And, and they didn't even know what the pieces were going to be. They didn't know where it would go, but they knew they had made something. Today, um, the maker community at Intel is much, much larger. And I took aside the, you know, 25,000 people who work in our factories who make a million chips a day. There are, even still, there's what, we, we took a poll, there's 1,400 people at Intel that classify themselves as maker. They're active in the maker community. They're building projects. Uh, just before I uh, came here this morning, I got an email from one of our employees. He's going to be on Shark Tank um, next weekend, or next Friday. And um, he's really proud. And it came from his making. He believes he has the best golf club, most accurate precision golf club putter in the world. Uh, and I told him, well, then the next thing to do is we need to put an Edison inside it and uh, make it smart. But, but it was an example to me, even just driving over here this morning, that, um, that there's a live, there, there's, a, there's a real passion inside our company now about making and creating. So next Friday, you can see an Intel employee on Shark Tank if you watch. Um, we're now involved in 20 maker fairs. So we uh, started really aggressively, I'd say, last... Uh, Last year, a little bit later than this, at uh, the um, Rome Maker Faire. And we've continued to grow our presence and our participation in that. We've got our um, latest two products. I put them up here. Galileo 2, uh, which if you haven't seen it, it's a pretty good product. Uh, but we're pretty proud of it. And then Edison. And um, Edison is something I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, because we actually have a lot of plans. Our plans is continue to shrink Edison down. And we believe within two or three years we can get the full Edison capability down to about the size of a, a little bit bigger than the button on your shirt or jacket uh, with the same compute capability. And I think about, um, I get a lot of questions. Okay, why are you building these products? And why are you connecting with the maker community? Um, Part of why we're building these products is because it's fun. There's a group of us who get together and kind of create these products and decide what they're going to be and kind of challenges ourselves to what we can do with them. And it's genuinely fun. Uh, and then it's also fun to see what people create with them. But more importantly, it's to connect with people like you. I truly believe that um, uh, the people in the universities who are going to take these boards and use them in their classes and create things with them. The people outside the universities who are out there, uh, you know, making at the maker fairs, doing Kickstarter programs, whatever, are the next set of entrepreneurs. And you don't know who's going to hit it big, right? We don't know. But being a part of that, engaging with that community, making sure that they know how to uh, work with a big company like Intel, being that bridge between the technology and these entrepreneurs, in my opinion, is critical for companies nowadays. So that's why we're engaged. The last thing is um, we did put together at CES last year a Make It Wearable contest using Edison. And we put about $1.3 million in prizes for that, um, which is a lot of money. But more importantly, the top projects that come out of this 
Uh, I've got uh, Hubert, who's the CEO of um, uh, Best Buy. I've got um, one of the guys from Dixon's, who's a European Best Buy equivalent, and some of the guys from Foxconn, all on the judging panel. And we're going to try and take the top uh, projects and actually take them to market and help these people get started, how to manufacture them, how to get them out into the, um, the supply chain. So it's, it's really what we hope is an incubator and, a, and a, an opportunity for these people to really uh, build a business from it. I thought I would give you an example. If you, um, if you heard anything about CES last year, uh, probably the most, you know, you go on stage, you're, you're, you're in front of 10,000 people or whatever, and it's broadcast to millions, and you've got all these demos, cool technology and everything. The number one product we put out there was this one. And what was interesting to me, and this one, I've gotten more emails, more requests for when is it going to be available. Um, almost everywhere I go, uh, somebody asks me, when is the charging bowl? going to come about. And um, uh, so I thought I would give you a story of this one because it's a great example of making at a large company. And what you see here is the progression of this bowl and the design. And it is a classic maker story. Where the idea came from is a bunch of us were sitting around a table one day and we were working on wearable devices and we decided you know, it would really be cool if we had a way, we were actually becoming frustrated with having to have uh, something to plug your wearable into, right? Because when you're thinking about the design, that's something that, that takes away from the design quality. She said, wouldn't it be cool if you could just put the wearable in something or throw it on something and it would just charge overnight? Uh, and it was a woman who said, well, what I do is I take my jewelry off at night and I throw it in a bowl. Why don't we just make a bowl that can just charge these things? And all the women are shaking their heads out there. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we were, it, was, it was pretty interesting. And all the guys in the room were like, oh, it's such a great idea. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, and so then we set out and said, OK, well, let's go figure out how to do this. How, how would you go make a charging bowl? So the first thing we did is we went down to Walmart. And we bought a ceramic bowl that was used for nacho chips. And um, you can see we built a little bowl, a board to, um, to manage the charging and a set of wires to build a coil. And basically, we were going to charge things through that. And um, to our surprise, it actually worked. As we, um, you know, you can see. Uh, actual devices, those are some, uh, we built some little devices that just had little LEDs on them so we could throw them in there and know that they were charging. And we also put like a headset in there. Then we said, okay, well that's pretty cool. Let's do one better. So we went and bought a more expensive bowl. This time we, we left Walmart and we went to Target. <laughs> I'm not kidding here. <laughs> that's what we did. We went to Target, we got a better looking bowl and we said, Let's see if this will go through different kinds of materials. And you know, we were just experimenting, very similar to what you could do in your garage or your kitchen table. And sure enough, it still worked. Then we pulled out our 3D printer and said, wait a minute. Now let's go see if we could actually build something that's an industrial quality. And this thing actually comes now in four pieces. Uh, and the coils are built in between the layers there. Uh, and it snaps together, and this will be on the market uh, right around the end of this year. Okay, and now you'll have to, for most of your phones, because most of your phones can't, um, uh, it'll be A4WP compliant, if you know wireless charging, that's kind of the modern, in my opinion, the more uh, robust charging. Uh, most phones don't have that built in, so you'll just have to buy a backing plate, and then you can throw your phone, your whatever you want. All the wearables we're building starting next year will be uh, A4WP compliant, so you just be able to throw them in this bowl. But all of this went across about 90 days from taco bowl to product, right? This is how, and, and, and this was the number one product at CES when we uh, 
you know, did our, our keynote at CES this year. And if, uh, if you went by our booth, it was the most, uh, you know, interesting product there for people. So it was amazing to me. And um, it was amazing to me just, you know, how the making, to me, this was a classic story of just a bunch of makers getting together and saying, we can do this. We can build one of these things. And the importance of having a diverse group, too, because I think a bunch of guys wouldn't have come up with as good an idea as a bull. We'd have had some thing that you hooked things on, and it was big and cool. <laughs> um, so th the next thing um, I'm going to show you is uh, something that we believe we've really targeted the making community for. And uh, we believe this will revolutionize not just the making community, but um, a variety of industrial applications. And um, I'll talk to you a little bit about them, but I want to first do a demonstration. So I'm going to ask Jonathan to come out. Jonathan's going to bring out, as soon as he unplugs, and he's going to plug in. And let's see, where's Laura? I have somebody here. Yes. So here's what we've done. Um, do you have one of the little camera? Do you still have that little camera on you? OK, no, no problem. We've taken basically um, one of your full 3D scanners. And um, uh, we've embedded it now. We, we actually bought a company that has developed these scanners. And we've continued to improve on the technology. And we can now put this in the bezel of any device. OK? So what you're seeing. And, and all that has to happen is, as the image becomes white, that means we've got the, the actual capture of the pixel. Um, and that's a, a real tablet, by the way. This will be uh, available uh, probably around Christmas, uh, a little early Christmas, back to school of 15. Uh, so next, next Christmas, back to school. Um, our goal is to be able to have you go buy just an average tablet and you can now scan whatever you want to go put into your 3D printer with your tablet. No need for an additional scanner. No need for additional uh, equipment. Uh, and this will all just be built in uh, to your tablet. Now, you can imagine just the, uh, um, the make uh, opportunities. But you can also uh, imagine the industrial applications as well. We've taken this, uh, I probably, I'm probably not helping his imaging. Um, we've taken this same uh, uh, camera setup and started to apply it to other products. Because what this allows you to do is see both optically and with infrared. And it, it projects so you can see across dark objects. And um, what I should have done was loaded up uh, an example, but we put three of these on a drone last week. And then we put an Edison on the drone to be able to be an intelligent system. Well, we think eventually what we need is six uh, of these cameras on the drone, um, in, including one facing down. But we were playing ping pong with a drone because what would happen is the drone will stay out of your way. It sees now. The drone can now see and think. And it doesn't need GPS. It can navigate with its own eyes. So now you can see the actual scan and image. So that probably took three or four minutes of, uh, oh, you did three? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan's playing. <laughs> um, but you can see that we have a, a, a true 3D image of Laura that you could now modify. We could make Laura, we could have a lot of fun with Laura right now. <laughs> How much is Laura willing to pay for us not to grow her nose or something? <laughs> no, but you could see you could take this to um, any 3D printing system now, CAD system. Uh, it captured the detail of her badge, uh, everything. And our goal is to just have every tablet you go out and buy have this capability. Every maker now can have this, this, this uh, uh, capability. And we'll keep driving these cameras. Eventually, within two or three years, I want to be able to put it on your phone. Go out, you see something you like, you just use your phone, you get a 3D image of whatever that is. Right? 
but what we're finding, like I said, in classic, uh, so so thank you. Oh, by the way, it does work. Uh, I, I I use my I don't I don't bring Flat Stanley with me anymore. I bring uh, Real Brian. Um, so um, it it does really work. We've scanned these and and sent them to three D printers. Um, what we're finding in True Maker Forum though is that that you build something like this and you find all kinds of applications, robotics. I gave you the drone example. We believe we can make um, by sometime next year drones that can fly autonomously uh, without GPS or anything. They just literally see and think, right? Robotics, uh, because you have the ability to see and think now. Uh, oh, there's the camera. This is our, uh, this is our current version of that camera. And we'll just build this into your tablets, your PCs, and then our, um, within two revs, we'll have it down so that it could fit long ways and inside your phone. We'll thin this down, and, and it'll just fit in your phone. So it'll fit on the back of your phone, just like your current camera. We have the first version. Um, if you, you, I'm sure you guys follow Intel religiously. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we demonstrate our first version of this. It's just got... Um, uh, not a projection camera at all. It, it uses three cameras and does a stereoscopic uh, processing. Uh, that that tablet we announced with Dell last week, and it will be available this Christmas. And it's really neat. You can do measurements. You can do uh, depth shifts. So you can you can take a picture, and I can make the center of focus here or back there. Anything you want. It's all just built in. You just go buy your tablet, and that will be in the back of it. Uh, it's the Dell 8, 8 7000 or something like that. Um, okay, so so I've showed you that making is important at a big company, and in fact, I believe it's critical. It's a critical skill. We're out hiring people like you guys. Um, there's a series of, of people. So Joey, Joey was in the audience here. Oh, there he is. Uh, Joey was our youngest uh, employee. I think we hired him when he was 17. Um, uh, and Joey's been working with us and helping us improve Galileo and play with Edison. We've got um, uh, Shubham, who was uh, is a really he's actually son of one of our employees. He's 12, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, he built a Braille printer, so it takes anything. It, it basically scans any um, written item and turns it into Braille. Real time. Uh, he's uh, he's funded. He's off and running, uh, and we've been helping him get going. And then there's Tim. Uh, Tim and a group of people in Chandler built the, what we call the connected wheelchair, and um, we actually built one of these for Stephen Hawking. Uh, and um, we've actually improved it now. What we can do, you uh, we put a wearable on the uh, person in the wheelchair. So we get all of their vital information, including because one of the biggest issues with people in wheelchairs is they f they fall, right? They hit a rock or they get a steep spot and they fall out of their chair. Um, and so our goal is to build an intelligent wheelchair that will, um, over time, if something like that happens, notify uh, contacts and things like that. But also, uh, it, they're connected and there's a mesh network basically of wheelchairs helping each other out, telling people you know, where are the good passages, where's the good places to go in your wheelchair, where, where, where are curbs bad, things like that. So we've got a bunch of, of projects that are, are going on in this space. Um, and then we're going to keep pushing innovation uh, a little bit further. Uh, we actually demonstrated it at our, our developer conference last week, but if you come into the lobby in about two months, we'll actually have a giant sand art and if uh, you were at Maker Faire San Mateo, um, uh, his name is Michael McCool, he's an Intel employee, and it's um, a Galileo-based system. We're actually going to post, uh, it's going to have web access, and so in our lobby we'll have a big sand art machine, uh, and people will be able to submit images that they want to build. We'll build them, uh, and then display them uh, in our headquarters. So it'll be kind of an open source uh, 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 system, and then we have Jimmy. Uh, we're putting the the cameras in Jimmy right now. He's our little robot, uh, and then we have a variety of different projects going on. 
so that's, that's my, my talk, is that there's a place for making uh, in a company. In fact, I think it's critical in an innovative company like Intel. And, um, and we are going to make, make better over time. Now. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>